Please be seated. Maybe one more little touch. Yeah, just out with this touch. I'm wild, but I don't know if I'm down. Last week we had a very obvious fear of death, whose voice is definitely soft in the mind. So but I think we've got it about worked out. That's yeah. Once yeah, well, yeah, that's a little better. Okay, try it. <laughs> How many of you never got past the first sentence of the gospel? Judas, not the spirit. Were you aware there are two Judases among the twelve? Who is this news to? Anyone? Well, it was news to me the first time I heard it. You know, the gospel's like, wait a minute, there's two guys in what is that about? Well, it's about... Oh, it is, I don't know. It's a, it's a confusing thing for sure. John's Gospel points out here that the person who's asking a somewhat intelligent question is, of course, not Judas Iscariot. Because Judas Iscariot never asked anything of worth in John's Gospel. The one time he does speak we are told in parentheses that, that he didn't really care about the poor. He was using the situation to get money because he was a thief. John really doesn't like Judas Iscariot. So he wants to make sure that nothing good could possibly be associated with him. If it was just that, we sort of just call it the end of the mystery. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke all have a list of names of the twelve. And Mark and Matthew do not have a second Judas. But they have two characters that Luke does not add. Simon of Anani or Thaddeus. So some people think that secretly his name was Judas. Because Luke says Judas son of James. Now they all end their list with and Judas Iscariot who betrayed Jesus. Now, what I always wonder about is why was this guy silent until Judas leaves? Judas Iscariot has just left from having his feet washed to go and betray Jesus, and now he speaks for the first time? There are many scholars who say something funny is going on with the name Judas and early Christianity. And one such theory is that we don't really know who betrayed Jesus, but that later distinction wanted to be clear that it was someone named Judas, which is a derivative of Judah or Jew. And so begins the shift away from Rome and away from the Romans and on someone particular who betrayed Jesus. Someone who was Jewish. And uh, Maureen, uh, from this morning's service at 9.30, reminded me that throughout Europe you will see uh, pictures, paintings of the Twelve, with Judas often looking to the other side, and with a prominent nose. As if to say, here's the one Jew among these lovely individuals. Now, I don't know for certain what was really going on when it comes to who is officially one of the twelve or not. But I think it is safe to say that a singular list of people would be suspect because none of the Gospels agree on that. But actually, I don't want to talk about that today. I, that gospel can sit there. I'm going to move to the book of Acts. I'm going to move to the book of Acts because we have this surprising story concerning Paul and his travel to the Athens. They had been strengthening churches in Syria and Cilicia, area toward the Jerusalem. Paul had a vision of a man who pleads with him, come to Macedonia, and help us. This meant crossing the Aegean Sea. In other words, they're going to Europe. 
But it's not for a holiday. Instead, it is across a dangerous sea to an unknown, potentially hostile environment. And then something happens in the text. It's so subtle, you probably don't recognize it, and you wouldn't unless you're reading straight through the book of Acts. The point of view changes. Until this point, whatever uh, it is Paul and Silas are referred to today, then all of a sudden, it says, we immediately tried to cross over to Macedonia. What is believed here is that the author of the book of Acts is now on the journey with them. This is now a first-hand account of what happens. Now, we don't know if this guy is, uh, was doing work somewhere else and now has joined Paul and Silas, or perhaps he was a sailor that was part of the needed boat to get them across. But all we know for certain is that this is a personal witness to the events that happen next. They reach the city of Philippi and the region of Macedonia, and the author tells us, on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate by the river, where we supposed there was a place of prayer. They were probably looking for a local synagogue in a place that was unfamiliar to them, certainly uncertain about what they were going to find. And we don't know if they found a synagogue. But what they did find was a gathered group of women. Now, I'm going to be honest here, Paul and his companions were likely disappointed. <laughs> not only they had not found the man of Paul's vision, but their patriarchal upbringing would have caused them to be disheartened in not finding men to dialogue with. <laughs> Nevertheless, Paul and his companions sit and speak with those gathered in a posture to be understood as serious teaching. The book of Acts is pushing us along our assumptions as to who can have dialogue about Jesus and the good news. And it's then that we meet Lydia. Now, Lydia is probably not a name that comes to most people's minds when they think of women in the Bible. Lydia's name simply means woman from Lydia, which was an ancient kingdom in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. She was the, from the city of Thyatira, which was known especially for its dyes. And we are told that Lydia of Thyatira is a dealer of cloth, and specifically purple cloth. And this is a big deal. Purple is the color of royalty and the very wealthy. Someone in dealing with purple cloth would be used to dealing with the wealthy and people of power, and thus would have considerable wealth and power themselves. And since Lydia herself is the dealer, which is an amazing reality for someone in the first century. We are told that she is a worshiper of God. Now, this could be she's a Jew, but more likely in this case, she's a Gentile who already held the Hebrew God in the highest esteem. You see, there was this uh, different categories of people who were all associated with the Hebrew God. And Lydia was probably one of those who was in sort of a competition between the local synagogues and this emerging Christian movement. So she's somewhere in an undefined place. But the fact that Lydia is present at this prayer, place of prayer outside the gate suggests that she was already seeking guidance and direction from the Spirit of God. Looking for meaning beyond her extraordinary success as a businesswoman. Then we are told the Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. Opened her heart. Now, that sounds really biblical, right? That's how God does things, opens people's heart. Except, well, that phrase is only found once in the Bible. Second book of Maccabees. However, Luke, in his gospel, uses the Greek verb opening 
in some really special cases, opening the eyes of the disciples post-resurrection, opening their minds to Scripture, and again, the disciples' minds at the very end when the risen Jesus appeared to them. So opening by the Lord is a sign of the resurrected Jesus doing something special. There was another time where the resurrected Lord did something really, really special in the book of Acts, and that was on the road to Damascus. Yes, it was Paul's calling into this new being where the risen Lord Jesus appears to them and points him in a new direction. Lydia has her own experience of that Lord and thus becomes Paul's very first convert to Christianity in Europe. She has the power and authority to have her whole household baptized. She's either the head of the household or the one who's really in charge. <laughs> and then she engages in a rhetoric that's worthy of the writer Paul. If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my home. I mean, how can they say no, right? That's the whole point there. She prevailed on us as the surprise author. They weren't expecting to stay with her. They were looking for this strange man, this vision guy, who, honestly, the text never tells us what they find. And I have to wonder if God was doing something special in this moment, but knowing men, that they want to do something special to say, hey, there's this woman who's going to be your inspiration and your benefactor when you get to Europe. No, there's a vision of a man that says, you have to come here immediately. And they say, oh, we've got to do that. And what they find is Lydia's heart open. And they stay with her, not for a day, not for two, the entire time. Their operations in Macedonia come out of Lydia's house. This is the inspiration for us here today. Whether we are currently the traveler following the vision or the one at home in faithful routine, we are to be ready for our hearts to be open, to be journeyers when it comes to being open to the Spirit of God. If they had only gone with what they expected, so much of the book of Acts doesn't happen. And the book of Acts is by far the most compelling case of transformation of societal norms. We see women not only in active ministry, but of leaders in society, business women, and ultimately leaders of the Jesus movement. So all those well, it's not biblical for a woman to be in charge. Point to Lydia, point to the book of Acts, and know for certain that God transforms any societal norms and makes real good change. Be like Lydia. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please stand as you are able.